Okay, yeah. Mm -hmm. So uh, anyway, uh, welcome everybody. Thank you for coming. We have our um, our Holocaust class uh, here. All our members there somewhere. And we, um, I know there's some community people and other, from the college as well as from um, the community. So it's always exciting and it's also being taped. So uh, you'll go out there in the whole world, or at least this part of the world, this part of the world. Anyway, we uh, want to uh, first of all say that this program is being sponsored by the Honors Program. Tom Grady, director, we really appreciate his support. And also, where did I put that? The Multicultural Committee, which um, Bob Rosendes, I think, was here, I don't know if he's, uh, and Farah Habib, who are the directors. <clears throat> so they are the um, sort of sponsors, along with uh, the course that uh, Dr. Timberg and I teach, uh, Remembering the Holocaust in Literature and History. Get that name right. Um, which we've been doing for 10 years. And uh, we're, we do have a series of programs which we are offering, this being the uh, first uh, for, to the community. Just mentioned before I forget that April 10th at 2 o'clock uh, in H210, which is right around the corner, we will be having another program on uh, trauma, survival trauma, by two psychiatrists from Harvard Medical School. So any of you who are interested, uh, please come to that as well. Well. We are really honored today to have a, um, a speaker who is uh, well versed in this subject, to say the least, Dr. Myrna Goldenberg, who um, comes from uh, Merlin by way of Brattleboro and Deerfield <laughs> recently. <laughs> She's a, a traveler in the East. But anyway, Dr. Goldenberg is a professor emerita uh, at Montgomery College. I mean, he's recently retired, but certainly very active, um, which is in Maryland, outside of uh, DC. She's the uh, founder and former director of the Peck Humanities Institute, which is located at the college. Um, during the 2005-2006 academic year, she was the Distinguished Visiting Scholar of Holocaust Studies at Stockton State College in New Jersey. She's also taught at uh, John Hopkins University, University of Maryland. Um, she uh, has presented all over the world, actually, on these subjects. She's also the editor and contributor to a number of books. I'll just mention a couple books. One is uh, Experience and Expression, Women, the Nazis, and the Holocaust, Teaching the Testimonies, Tension and Tikkun, Teaching the Holocaust in Colleges and Universities. And then this book that just came out, Different Horrors, Same Hell, Gender and the Holocaust. And if you are interested, this is, looks like a great book. Just came out in 2013, right? Last month. Last month, so University of Washington Press. Um, she's also, I looked at her um, resume, many pages, and she's written many, many articles on this subject, uh, a couple of which uh, our students have read. So um, we are very happy to have her. Um, I first heard her at a conference that I went to last October, in the, uh, which was the 25th anniversary of the LeFranc Holocaust Education Conference, which is at Seton Hill University, uh, a Catholic university, which is part of the, actually, the National Catholic Holocaust Education um, conference, which tells you something about the fact that the church, among other, have been trying to deal with this subject for many years and have done a good job. So, uh, with all of that said, um, here is Dr. Goldenberg. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Weisberger and Dr. Tinberg, for having me and all those sponsors who brought me here. I, I really appreciate it. Now, I'm going to do something I've never done before, which is present without my glasses. I can see, but let's just hope I, I left my glasses in somebody's office, so <laughs> that's the way it is. I'm going to tell you um, pretty much what I've been doing 
about what I've been doing, and and I welcome any questions you might have afterwards. But uh, let me first uh, ask you to hold any questions and any comments till the end, okay? And I'm going to try to work that machine as well. Now, nearly 30 years ago, after a trip to Mauthausen Concentration Camp, which is a Camp 3, uh, uh, the Segment 3, which was uh, considered one of the hardest camps, so the Class 3 tier was normally starvation or uh, murder through work, and that included starvation. After a trip to that camp, I immersed myself in the study of the Holocaust. I was traumatized by that visit. Before too long, I concentrated on women in the Holocaust and doing that because I combined my previous work on women's studies with the work on the Holocaust. So that's how I came to women and the Holocaust, independently and then a merger. My research gave me insight into the bonding process between women, and I've devoted my more recent research to exploring three specific areas. The differences in the way men and women prisoners cope with hunger, that's one. The issue of sexual violence, and it's uh, heavy in that book uh, that you, you just held up. And in a brand new turn for me, the subject of Jewish women's expression of their Holocaust experiences through poetry and the visual arts, which is pretty much untouched. So, the microphone a little bit. there, okay? Yes. Oh, it's got an echo. Okay. So I'm going to share my findings about hunger and sexual violence and then move on to the arts, uh, which is in this emerging field, as I just said. I also want to clarify that we have finally moved away from the controversy of whether we should include gender in our study of the Holocaust. Fifteen years ago, in 1998, Gabriel Schoenfeld, the editor of Commentary Magazine, published an article blasting gender-related studies of the Holocaust, and he accused about a half a dozen of us of pushing a feminist agenda. And he argued that such a focus would dilute the issue of anti-Semitism as it influenced Nazism. Now, to my knowledge, no one has ever claimed that the Nazis privileged gender over anti-Semitism, or that anti-Semitism was not the major reason for the Holocaust. All Jews were targeted, but men and women and babies were treated differently by the Nazis. Hence, different horrors, same hell. Schoenfeld was wrong, and he apologized, to me at least, for misquoting me and decontextualizing my comments. Ironically, his attack in Commentary Magazine, which has a pretty good circulation, raised the consciousness of and attracted many male and female scholars to gender study. So he's probably kicking himself. <laughs> To summarize my earlier work on hunger, we can conclude that there were differences in the, way, in the ways in which men and women reacted to hunger. Both sexes were starved equally, and they talked incessantly about their hunger. In fact, I just read some articles about, uh, some statistics about Mauthaus in the camp that I was at, that I visited many years ago in the early 1980s, and that's a, it's built on a granite quarry, and there are 186 steps that each prisoner had to climb down to the quarry and then carry back up on their shoulders 100 to 150 pounds of granite. And they did that on a diet of 600 to 1,000 calories a day. Now that is impossible, and most of them died, either by being pushed over the edge of the quarry, which was you know, way down, or else starving to death or exposed in this very cold way, very cold weather. So they were starved and they talked about hunger. Every single survivor talks about that in, in her or his memoir. In women's memoirs, though, hunger often evoked a response rooted in the imagination, situated in the kitchen, and remembered through socialization. By that I mean, women recalled meals and recipes and shared them with their barrack mates. 
This simple act of exchanging recipes or teaching someone to cook was and is an expression of hope for the future. You don't teach anything if you don't anticipate a future. So unconsciously, they were more optimistic than they might otherwise have been. We unconsciously assume a future, assume a future when we teach what we know to one another and to the next generation. I don't know what that's doing, and just ignore it for a while. <laughs> <laughs> These sessions of recipe sharing were positive reactions to a negative situation, an absolute negative evil situation. Interestingly, though, since most Jew European Jewish women at that time, and I probably more than just Europe, probably worldwide, lived in multi-generational families, those in the camps, those women who managed to get into the camps, rather than being gassed before they could be registered for camp, probably had done little or no cooking. Their mothers or their grandmothers probably did the cooking in the pre-deportation days. And it's likely that these older women were already gassed by the Nazis before they were in, into the barracks. Uh, anyone who looked older than 40 gassed at, on arrival. So uh, these were the women who knew how to cook, but the food talk came from the next generation. The women in the camp cooked with their mouths, and that's a phrase that a survivor, Susan Chernock Spots, uses to describe the interminable discussions about menus and dishes. She was, she said, never as good a cook in the kitchen as she was with her mouth. Now, beware. I would not recommend that you ever try to follow the recipes that were collected from the camps, because essentially <coughs> these are women who didn't cook, who were trying to outdo some, the next person who said, no, we used a quarter of a pound of raisins, oh no, we used a quarter of a pound of something else, of currants and so on. It was all in their imagination. There was very seldom were they the people who did the cooking. So the recipes have to be approached with some skepticism. Now cooking with the mouth or recipe sharing was a way to perpetuate the customs and the rituals of the Jewish calendar. In fact, Jewish cuisine is pretty much calendar based, holiday based. It's Shabbat based as well. So Jewish women still take pleasure in sharing new Passover recipes, which is the last day of that is today. And it breaks the monotony tomorrow. It depends, it depends, it depends. It depends. Okay, if you follow the Israeli calendar or the European American calendar. Um, sharing a new Passover recipe breaks the monotony of generations and years and decades of the same old recipes, no matter how luscious and delicious and welcome they are. But in the camps, learning how to prepare something called a tzimis, which is really a, a mess, um, a mixture, okay? Uh, or chopped liver, or gefilte fish, or kugel, which is Yiddish for pudding, for the, or gefilte fish is for the Seder, not only transmitted a practical knowledge about Jewish customs, but also celebrated the Jewish religion. Now think of the irony there. They're in the camp because the Jews are supposed to be annihilated, and here they are getting some, some uh, interest in living through remembering the calendar, through remembering the Jewish calendar. But even more, a recipe normally honored a murdered rel relative, a woman, a grandmother, even a mother, who had been gassed already, or starved to death, or murdered some other way. And it kept the memory of her life alive because it was a Tante Sarah's um, apple cake, or, or Bubby's, which is grandmother in, in Yiddish, um, chicken soup. So it kept alive the memory of a woman who is already dead. And in doing so, you don't really die. You live on somehow. We share these recipes that we learned from someone else. So the memory is kept alive. These discussions also reminded women of their importance in the family. Not as the pigs and the vermin that the SS said they were, but as independent and contributing members of a community, even a, a family community. So thus, in a setting of starvation and brutality, 
Sometimes food talk was a countermeasure to the Nazi goal of total annihilation of their people. I have to intercept just to say this to you. One of the survivors I spoke to called it gastronomic masturbation. <laughs> they would, when they sit around and talk about food. Food talk took all kinds of forms. In the Canada section of Birkenau in 1944, Canada was the place of the clothing depot. When you are murdering millions of people, you take their clothing first and you, you need to sort it. And these huge warehouses of clothing and other uh, objects they brought with them was called the Canada section for a lot of reasons. You can ask me later. But anyway, the, these women um, in the Canada section sorting clothes, there was one group of four of them, uh, many, many more, but the one particular group of four published a newspaper called the Canada Observer. And they wrote it on strips of paper and they read them aloud on Sundays to other prisoners who gathered between the barracks. That's where they would, they would have their discussion. At that point in the war, Canada prisoners didn't work on Sunday. In her slim volume of poems, Batsheva Dagan, an Israeli, the book is called Imagination, Blessed Be, Cursed Be, Reminiscences from There, meaning the camps. She was a survivor of six German prisons. She was a messenger in the Warsaw Ghetto, a Polish housemaid on forged papers, and a 20-month veteran of Auschwitz-Birkenau. So she devoted one issue to food of this underground paper. The first article, Practical Suggestions for Canada Women, Successful Canada Women. It was a list of bullets, two of which said, quote, one who cannot steal is too dumb to have a meal. Then she said, quote, cut the bread into seven slices to avoid tomorrow's crisis. Mm -hmm. Save it. Next followed recipes for camp soup, fried potatoes, and cutlets. Now, these were weeds that were called herba supi supiana auschwitziana. In other words, whatever they could find from the mud. Pudding and meat, which begins with first take a microscope, position the lens, and search carefully. The newspaper also featured titles of films that could be shown to inmates if they were so lucky, but of course they weren't. One was called The Grand Illusion, Freedom. Another was called Two New Shores Behind Barbed Wires, and so on. Newspapers, no matter how humorous or tongue-in-cheek, could not satisfy hunger. But such diversions created a distraction from the fear of starving to death, which was an ever-present fear. For some, food talk could have been an act of heroic resistance, a refusal to despair or become dehumanized. Now in men's memoirs, hunger was rooted in the stomach and in memory rather than the imagination, evoking meals in a state of freedom. Men spoke and wrote about their hunger and distress and con confessed their willingness to do just about anything to alleviate that hunger. Thus for them, the men, starvation was a manifestation of Nazi power and their hunger was proof of their vulnerability, their dependency, and their loss of status as breadwinners and heads of family. So it had a tremendously demoralizing effect. In his book, Viktor Frankl says in Man's Search for Meaning, that, quote, I quote, the desire for food was the most, was the major primitive instinct around which mental life was centered. He went on to say that the subject of discussion was favorite dishes, and the prisoners would exchange recipes, these are the men prisoners, and plan the menu for the day they would have a reunion. And they would go on and on, picturing it in detail. Now, Frankel's reference to recipes is very rare. Very few men have, make reference, they talk about their hunger, but they don't talk about recipes. For the most part, men's memoirs do not have exchanges of recipes. Ironically though, Frankel protests and told the men in his barracks that such talk was dangerous. And he said in quotes, they, it afforded momentary psychological relief, but it was unhealthy in that it was an illusion, which physiologi physiologically surely must not be without danger. So here Frankel betrays a perspective 
acutely ignorant of the depths of the impact of food talk on women's identity and community. Food talk helped women create community. Men were more likely to bond over uh, rit religious rituals, common languages, and origins. Like women, they bonded, and they also created surrogate families, camp sisters, I mean, well, camp brothers, camp fathers, but not nearly to the same extent as we find in women's memoirs. And when you talk to a woman survivor, inevitably she'll say, it was my camp sister or my camp mother who made the difference in my survival. In other words, when they were left without their family, they created surrogate families. Now, and men did not attribute, uh, in none of the books, really, except Primo Levi's survival in Auschwitz, does anyone, uh, does a man attribute his survival to another person? Levy, if you remember, talks about getting an apple from somebody and how that helped him through those years, those months. Now, it is reasonable to attribute their different coping skills, men's and women's, to their socialization. This is not genetics. In traditional European Jewish homes in the first half of the 20th century, women were more responsible for food preparation than men were. Women lived in what was called the private or domestic sphere. And under conditions of extreme, extraordinary stress, as in the camps, they spoke about what they knew or thought they knew or thought they should know, which was about food. Now, although all Jews were targeted for death, Jewish women faced what Joan Ringelheim called double jeopardy. That is, they were marked for death just as men were, but they were subject to different treatment in several respects. Biology now played a substantial role in the Nazi treatment of women. Dysmenorrhea, amenorrhea, pregnancy were uniquely part of women's lives and not men's. And for the most part, women stopped menstruating because of the loss of body fat, which has an effect on hormones, and they stopped eating. They stopped, they did stop eating, but they stopped menstruating because they were emaciated. A good many women described the fear that they would never be able to have children because they stopped menstruating. Pregnancy, Jewish women's pregnancy in the Nazi era, in the Nazi camps, was forbidden. It was absolutely against the law. And visibly pregnant women were sent directly to the gas chambers. Childbirth almost always led to the death of a newborn because women did get um, rounded up and deported while they were pregnant in the early months. And then in a few months, they would show. And some, some women carried to term. Babies were born. Most of the time, the babies had to be drowned. Most of the times, the babies died. I mean, you, just, they, you could not keep a baby alive in a barracks. And it meant, if you kept the baby alive, that the mother would also go to the gas chamber. Um, Mengele, the infamous Dr. Mengele, said that he wouldn't be so heartless as to send an infant to the gas chamber without its mother. So he would send them both. Where women's physiology also made them vulnerable to rape and other forms of sexual violence, in spite of the fact that any contact between an Aryan male, a German male, and a Jewish female, or between an Aryan female and a Jewish male, was forbidden by law. The 1935, among the 1935 law, Nuremberg laws, was one that forbade race mixing, or in German, Rassenschande. It was called the law for the protection of German honor and blood. It was felt that this law would prevent racial impurity, it would preserve racial purity, because the contamination of Aryan blood with a Jewish woman, or fluids from a, from a Jew, would pollute the Aryan race for generations. And Jews were the chief pollutants. Hitler identified them, likened them to vermin, to bacilli, so they were the cause of contagion and contamination. The law was stern and often led to death of the perpetrator. By 1945, it was one of the 43 crimes in Nazi Germany that called for the death penalty, but it was intermittently carried out. Certainly in the case between an Aryan woman and a Jewish man, the man was tried and almost always found guilty. 
and executed. One famous case, the case of Leo Katzenberger, who was an elderly Jewish businessman in Nuremberg, was portrayed in the 1961 film Judgment at Nuremberg. And if you ever can get a chance to see that, I recommend it highly. It is a graphic movie. It was the first time that Hollywood used films from the Germans, from the Nazi era documentaries, films taken by the Nazis, so proud of the work they were doing, used in a Hollywood movie. And it was the first time that any kind of documentary film was integrated into a Hollywood movie, Judgment at Nuremberg. So this, was, this case was portrayed in this movie. Um, Katzenberger was accused of seducing Irene Seiler, a young woman played by Judy Garland, when in actuality, he was responding to her father's request to give help to her, uh, getting her settled in a photography business. The case was salacious. The newspaper, the very, very anti-Semitic newspaper, Der Sturmer, listed all their alleged sexual contacts, some of which were supposed to have happened in the evening. I mean, contacts like just holding a hand or being together in close proximity under a street uh, lamplight, that made the crime public. So it was not just the bedroom that they were interested. Making it public made it more, a more serious crime. The trial, like other Ross and Chandra trials, was a sexual spectacle. Katzenberger had no chance and was guillotined, even though Hitler himself thought the judge was overzealous. Seiler, Irene Seiler, was sentenced to two years but released after six months. Frankly, I had not considered the idea of rape during the Holocaust, Holocaust to be a substantive issue because um, of that law to prevent, to pre preserve the, the uh, honor of, Jew of German blood. But then I began to interview women and in a couple of interviews and after hours and hours of talking, two different women in different interviews, different locations, told me that they were raped. They whispered that they were raped. They didn't want their husbands, who were in other parts of the building of the, their homes, to hear that they were raped. They never told anyone. So they blurted out their experiences, you know, their rape experiences quietly, even as it, like a conspiratorial kind of thing. And they asked me not to include the rapes in any papers I would write about them. They trusted me with the information and with respecting their admonition to keep their secrets. And I have done so because they don't want the shame of rape to be known to their husbands, children, and grandchildren. But I haven't written their stories because I feel just as conflicted about leaving out the rape as I would about putting it in. So I haven't done anything about it. Almost every woman survivor I have read or spoken with has described the sexual humiliations that they faced when they entered the camps. If you read any memoirs, you know that there was prolonged nakedness, there was ex examination of their genitals by men, jeering by the SS men making fun of them, full body shaves by other, <coughs> SS, other camp prisoners, men though, and very rough physical treatment, beatings. Seldom had they mentioned rape. Reticence about rape is to be expected. We're talking about a different era, one in which when women who were raped, women who were raped were unjustly labeled damaged goods. And these survivors who were raped internalized that kind of a label. And to the days I spoke to them, both of them are dead now. I still can't write their stories because I can't do so and include the rape. I have to respect their memories. They, they internalize that label and it's, they live with guilt, unearned guilt, all their lives. Rape during the Holocaust is a complex issue. During that time, it was not a weapon of war as it was in Bosnia and Rwanda. It was not a tool to cleanse a culture. It was a violent act of aggression, often accompanied by torture and followed by death. Wartime rape, in contrast to genocidal rape, is called a ritual of war, a physical manifestation of the domination of vulnerable victims, both male and female. 
it was seen as a recreational act of a conqueror to prove that his victims, both male and female, were powerless. As Susan Brown Miller um, has written, and I would suggest that you look her up, it's a book written in the 60s, um, it begins with against women or something like that, Brown Miller, you can't miss it. She says, rape destroys remaining illusions of power and property for the men of the defeated side. The body of a raped woman becomes a ceremonial battleground, a parade ground for the victors trooping of the colors. Vivid proof of the victory of one for one and the loss and defeat for the other. So just consider the rape of Nanking in 1937 and 8, and the rape of thousands of women by the Russians in 1945. Something like, you know, 80 percent of the women were raped when the Russians came through. And even the rape of Northern European women by the Allies after D-Day. But rape during the Holocaust had a profoundly demeaning and useless dimension. During the Holocaust, the Nazis dominated the Jews. There was no ambiguity. The implementation of the final solution was evidence of Nazi physical and political superiority. Rape and other acts of sexual violence were redundant tools of terror and dominance, but not a crime in and of itself. The crime, on the other hand, was race mixing, pollution of the Aryan blood's line. That was a serious crime. We can speculate about what motivated these rapists and sexual torturers and why Rosenschanda was not an effective deterrence, and it wasn't. Even many scholars had assumed that Rosenschanda precluded the possibility of rape until evidence proved otherwise. But it is still hard to get many, I have to say, male scholars to believe that rape occurred, even though there's evidence to the contrary. Rape occurred in the ghettos and in the camps, uh, everywhere uh, f during the Third Reich, but most conspicuously in the eastern provinces. The further away from Berlin, the more rape you had. As the four Einsatzgruppen squads, you know, the murder squads that went through uh, eastern, west, eastern Poland, Western Russia, um, in Eastern Poland and former Soviet Union, they virtually ritualized the death process of Jewish women. Jewish women were stripped publicly, raped in the presence of their family, and then murdered. No victim, no crime. Okay? The various black books, the black books are compendia of contemporaneous witnesses, reports of the atrocities, describe a plethora of violent acts against women. In 1940 in Warsaw, Jewish women and young girls were snatched from the streets and raped or raped in their homes in the shop, it, or shops. I want to read you something from the Black Book of Polish Jewelry. Quote, a mass rape took place in a mirror shop. Orgies on the part of German soldiers took place in the house of M. Sereski, a well-known Warsaw Jew who lived on Pius Street. Another mass rape occurred during a rape in uh, Franciszkanska Street. Forty Jewish girls were dragged into the house, which was occupied by, by German officers. There, after being forced to drink, the girls were ordered to undress and to dance for the amusement of their torture, tormentors. Beaten, abused, and raped, the girls were not released till 3 a.m. The same source also explains that in the Tolchin camp, Tolchin is in Ukraine, quote, from which no one returned alive, the commandant asked each night for two Jewish virgins. An underground newspaper in Lvov, October 1941, now it's called Lviv, tells of rapes that occurred during Nazi raids. Quote, women were raped in the middle of the streets. The murderers dragged Jewish women out of their apartments and cut off their breasts. It is estimated that the number of victims reached a few thousand, unquote. The Molotov note, so named for V.M. Molotov, the Russian foreign minister who prepared it, January 1942, this is early, was entered into evidence at Nuremberg. It listed attacks on women in the occupied areas, including one that took place, another one, in Lvov. Quote, 32 women working in a garment factory were first violated and then murdered by German stormtroopers. Drunken German soldiers dragged the girls and women into a park which is named, where they savagely rape them. 
The Black Book of Soviet Jewelry tells another harrowing story. In an early July 1941 in Riga, Latvia, the Nazis celebrated their successful mass murders by herding, and now I'm reading it straight from the Black Book, several dozens of Jewish girls to their orgy. They forced them to strip naked, dance, and sing songs. These were uh, University of Riga students. Many of these unfortunate girls were raped right there and then taken out to the yard to be shot. Captain Bach, one of the officers, surpassed everyone with his invention. He broke off the seat cushions of two chairs and replaced them with sheets of tin. Two, two girl students of Riga University were tied to the chairs and seated opposite each other. Two lighted primus stoves, kerosene stoves, were brought and placed under the seats. The officers really liked this sport. They joined hands and danced in a ring around the two martyrs. The girls writhed in torment, but their hands and feet were tightly bound to the chairs, and when they tried to shout, their mouths were gagged with filthy rags. The room filled with the nauseating smell of burning flesh. The German officers just laughed, merrily doing their circle dance. In some memoirs and testimonies, women talk about a friend who had been raped or used. And it is quite likely that the introduction of another woman as victim spares them from revealing a humiliating experience to themselves, a personal experience. They just couldn't face and so they wrote about it as if it was someone else. Besides, most Jewish women who were raped did not live to talk about it, and those who did are likely to protect themselves from these painful memories. It is important for all of us to regard the Holocaust as a unique event. It was unprecedented. To judge its victims against normal ethics and standards is to impose additional suffering on them. For example, we read of many instances of sex in exchange for bread, or what I call bartered sex, or sex for survival, in the camps. Some memoirs condemn these women for using their bodies to buy survival. My feeling is we have no right to judge a starving shell of a woman who sought to use her body as a life-saving commodity. Why not judge the survivor prisoner who sought her body? And this is a subject that has still not received much attention and making, makes very many men very uncomfortable when I talk about it. The male survivors who demanded sex for an apple or a pair of shoes or a discarded sweater have not revealed themselves. And Jewish women survivors now in their 80s and 90s are still unlikely to relieve the victimization or publicly condemn other Jews who took advantage of them. Now, not every survivor uses language to tell her story. I'm shifting. You can relax a little bit. No more terror. Memory is not linear or chronological, writes Carol Shields in her book, The Diaries, the Shield, the Carol Shields, the Stone Diaries. And memory is not a narrative. Memory is like a series of slides, which I'm going to use, any one of which, which may flash up at any time in no particular order, but I do have an order, and without links between them. In the mind, some years vanish into a black hole of oblivion, while a few minutes might hang there forever, brilliant with detail and effect. Survivors of any genocide live with the text of their experiences imprinted on the insides of their eyelids. They close their eyes and they relive their experiences of their own terror and of the terrors they witness. Not once, but over and over and over again. But to tell their stories to someone else, some women, men and women, I suppose, need a different way to tell that, that tale. And they use art, whether it's literary, musical, or visual. Art about the Holocaust counteracts the attempt to render Jewish death anonymous. And that art, as we witness it, makes us secondary witnesses. In the process, we acquire two types of memories, those of the survivors and those of our own responses to the survivor's art. 
to paraphrase Adam Zich, who was a poet and compiler of a book called The Auschwitz Poem, Poems, art enabled one to survive, not in the biological sense, but in the psychological sense, because it helped preserve self-esteem. Art of the Holocaust ought to be treated not only as exceptional documents of bygone years, but also in the psychological dimension. Literature and the arts in the world of collapsing values aroused faith in fellow humans and in the salvation of human ideals. They helped to survive in such extreme condition and they aroused faith or hope in survival. So art was more or less a defense mechanism for those who used it. And Zeke has other things to say about it, but one, one more quote from him, art enabled people to preserve internal freedom, and it gave an opportunity to develop one's personality and allowed self-realization. One example of this uh, authentic artistic resistance against dehumanization is a woman named Lily Hurt. And I'm gonna try the slide business. <laughs> Be patient. Ah, my hero. Okay, I think it's. You want the uh, this one? The, the pictures? Yeah. The one right there. Yeah. I can do it if you want. Good. <laughs> I'll try it. This is Lily Hurt. Um, she w was a survivor, an Israeli. I spoke to her daughter and her granddaughters, and everything I know about her is from them. She was born in Yugoslavia in 1923 and deported to Auschwitz along with 700 others, probably in May 1944. Earlier in 1940, when she was 17, she had gone to live with an aunt in Novi Sad, which is Hungary, uh, where she studied literature, drawing, and sculpture. In 1944, aware of Nazi intentions, she buried a jar that she had decorated. That's the next slide. You can just click right on the arrow. And when she came out of the camp, she dug it up. That's why it looks that way. It's now in Yad Vashem in Jerusalem. In it, she had personal documents, including a birthday card that her father had sent her on her 17th birthday. She f spent five or six month in, months in Birkenau before she was transferred to a factory in Czechoslovakia near Prague. In Auschwitz, because she was known as a palm reader, I want to go back to her so that you can see her. Ah, okay. She, was, she had a reputation as a, someone who read palms. A German capo singled her out. She beat her and then commanded her to read her palms, her rough palms. And she posed the question to Lily, will Hitler succeed in this war? Lily's response probably saved her from more violence. And she said, I can only answer this question if I could read de Fuhrer's hand. So she saved herself. Apparently the women in the barracks knew of the capo's boyfriend and who he was fighting on the Russian front. Brazenly, Lily knew that too, asked the capo about her boyfriend's status. According to Lily's daughter, Daniela, the capo's face softened and the next morning she gave Lily a waiver from work and from roll calls which could last four to six hours, starting at four in the morning in any weather, and asked her to illustrate her love letters to her boyfriend. She said she hoped that these decorated love letters would soften his heart and appeal to him. He had not been as enthusiastic about the capo as she was about him. So Lily's new job was to decorate the capo's love letters. She kept the colored pencils and stole or found scraps of paper which she distributed to her barrack mates and later brought with her to the labor camp. Hungry for spiritual food, she devised a plan of spiritual resistance to help raise the morale of the women in her barracks, to bring relief, she said, for our painful souls. She ran a contest for the best poem, artwork, or song in the barracks. And I want to go to, yeah, okay, more. Can we run that as a slideshow? These are examples of just 12 examples that have survived. Amazing. She kept them in her clothing, co close to her body. She would otherwise have lost them. 
For the first prize, she was the judge. For the first prize, there was a piece of bread or two small potatoes that she saved from her own rations. That meant she starved that day. Second prize was a sewing needle that she made out of a piece of wire or sliver of wood. And a sewing needle was very important because if you had, if, you, uh, if your buttons were off, you got beaten, 25 lashes. If anything was torn, you got beaten. So you needed, you could always get thread, you just pulled a thread out of whatever clothes you were wearing, but a needle was something special. And for the third prize was a palm reading. So she encouraged the women, you can keep on going through, to participate in the contest, to draw and write about their dreams and the land of Israel. And you can see that some of these pictures were totally incongruous. You know what the what the prisoners wore. And here's someone who was who's drawing fashionable clothes. I mean, these are Parisian outfits kind of things. Again, her daughter explains that the women built a temporary podium made of crates, and they stood on them and read their poems, acted short skits. Now, how's that for a, an image of what you want to be? So well done. Discussed, and they just they had melodies, and they sang, and they dreamed of uh, liberation. In Auschwitz, Lily had tried to write a diary and compose poetry, and in the, but she couldn't. In the Lorenz factory, she continued to write and draw and was careful to preserve the works of herself and her girlfriends. On their day off, she, called, she organized what she called cultural time. According to other prisoners, Lily was the center of a small group of women who decided to find an outlet within their horrible existence. So they tried to recreate a world they lost and to erect a corner of sanity. One of her barrack mates, still alive, Rachel Avenel, describes the origin of Lily's competition. She said, one day I became friendly with another prisoner, Lily Kretschner, and we stuck, struck out a conversation, deciding that those miserable murderers will not succeed to abolish our humanity. We needed to feed our spirit, she said, to muster our strength and create something good and beautiful, which would help us pass the atrocious time. Lily worked relentlessly to encourage the girls to express their creativity. You can leave it her on. That's how Cultural Sunday, which became very successful, was formed. Lily collected all the pieces of paper, our creations as she called them. At night she placed them by her head so it won't, wouldn't get lost, she said. And, but only a fraction survived and when Lily left the camp she hid what she could under her shirt. Cultural Sunday did not work for everybody, but there were 400 women for whom it did work, and that makes, that makes a difference. Except a second example of authentic artistic resistance, one which bears the mark of what is traditionally labeled women's work, is the story of Esther Niesenthal Krinitz. Now I need a, another section. Do you need a PowerPoint? Yep. Okay. I'll do it. I'll play it for you. You just leave one on, okay? From the beginning? No, that one, just that one is fine, okay? These are, well, she was born in 1927 in Poland, in a rural village. She watched the Nazis enter her village and deport her whole family, except for her sister Manya and herself. They fled the village where they would be recognized and passed as Catholic farmhands and survived the war. Later, 50 years later, Esther, who had been trained at age nine as a seamstress, told her story in 36 magnificent wall hangings, all of which are made from fabric and yarn, embroidery and collage. Take a look at this. This is bad perspective, it's an early work, but you can see, I'm supposed to be talking into this, the girl's braids come off the off the canvas, every flower is separately drawn, sewn really. Every piece of the wood, the, the thatch on the roof is three dimensional. It's not, it comes up, it's raised from the canvas. All the details, that's her family. It's her, she's carrying water on her shoulders, she was the water carrier. Her sister, her mother sitting with the baby, her father and her brother and everyone is drawn. And she used fabric that was as close to the original as possible. She created these wall hangings to tell her story to her children and grandchildren. Her daughters have used them to tell their mother's story to the world. And they constitute a traveling exhibit, usually part of a panel to discuss the issue of genocide. 
the hangings or story cloths are gripping tableau that engage us by their content, content and artistic merit. She was one of five children and lived an entirely rural existence. Notice the house has split logs, and each, each log is, is drawn, is sewn separately and the walls and floors of packed earth. So this slide is called Childhood Home. Her father was a horse trader. There he is. With, no, the son is with the horse there. Her mother raised chickens and geese and sold eggs at the market. Uh, her life was marked by celebrations of the Jewish holidays and services were led by her grandfather and his neighbor. And we can go to the next slide. I think it's one called Passover. Okay, you can just go to the slide by hitting the arrow keys. I can hit the arrow. I can hit the arrow. <laughs> okay. I actually need to head back to the desk. But okay, go ahead. I'll just hit the arrows. That's very good. <laughs> okay. Um, this is a, a, a hanging of the women of the village who got together in one of the homes and made matzahs. And it's, it shows them kneading the matzah, taking out the matzah, baking the matzah, rolling it out, taking it in and out of the oven. Uh, and everything is so detailed. It's rather, I think, amazing. Okay? In September 1939, the Jews of her region began to fear for their lives. Okay. In this one, the Nazis come, Nazis arrive, and the Germans made the village women do their laundry and cook because she had chickens her, that laid eggs. You know, Her mother was ordered to bake for the major. The young men were ordered to dig trenches. I don't know if you can see it on this, but the horse's eyes are averted from the Nazis. So, I mean, little details like that are in all of her wall hangings. Each, each hen is different. For her region, an area southwest of Lublin, the first year of occupation was relatively free of brutality. The brutality followed. But the war affected their livelihood, and everyone was forced to find work. Esther and her sister Manya worked for nearby farmers, for which they got a small amount of money and some food. And then one day, in April of 41, two soldiers walked into the house, seeing the table, this is not on the slide though, uh, set for Passover, they tore off the tablecloth, sending all the food and dishes flying. There is a slide like that, but I don't have it. They began to tear her father's prayer shawl from him, and that's what you see over there. The major's aide, who was quartered in a nearby house, heard the commotion and stopped the attack on Esther's father. However, the soldiers came back in the evening, found the goose under the table, because there was no longer a tablecloth on it. They had pulled the tablecloth off. They grabbed the goose and killed it, thereby killing a major source of the family's income. Esther's father and brother escaped to the pine forest where they spent the summer collecting pine tar, which would be made into turpentine for a local landowner. By September of 1942, the Germans stepped up the killing process and began deporting Jews. This is called Dawn Raid. You can't read it, but underneath each uh, story cloth, she embroidered the caption. You could read the caption right underneath that. As a, you can't, but you can in person, okay? The house was raided again. They fled to the fields, returning later in the day to an already ransacked house and just in time to find the soldiers entering their yard. They scattered and much later returned home. Here they're in their night clothes. And the neighbors are watching. Scattered. They, this is the mother and Esther, her sister, and the, younger, the youngest sister. Look at the wheat. Look at these fields. Every single stem, every single grain is separately you know, sewn on this. It's a very busy, busy, busy wall hanging. And you have the, the grain is so high they come above her clothes. She's in the grain. She's in the field. And so it's like a you know, double layer. This is one of my favorites because of all the intense work. The mother's shawl has fringes which come right out of the canvas. 
So that's fleeing across the fields. On the, October 15, 1942, the family was ordered to leave and join all the other Jews on the way to the railroad station, which is deportation. And that's where they were all on their way to the field. And it's called, We Will All Perish. The Jews were told to take only money and jewelry. Esther was determined not to go to the railroad station, and she and her 10-year-old sister, Manya, fled to a non-Jewish home, a family uh, that was a, a, a friend of the family. Stefan, I don't know if I have that slide. No, I don't. Stefan hid them for two days, and then he told them that they they had to leave because they were endangering his family. So they escaped to the forest. And at that point, Esther told her sister, we have different personas, we're different people now. She was Josephine or Josia, and Manya became Maria or Margisha. She instructed her sister never to speak Yiddish again. And they made their way from town to town, fleeing each time they were asked for identity papers. They ran to w the woods every time they were asked, and they realized if they were found there, they would certainly be taken for Jews. So they fled to a town a little bit further away where they got jobs as farm hands with two different farmers. Now this is interesting. She was tending the flowers. Notice there are beehives in the back. For some reason, the Nazi soldiers attracted the bees. And she said, the bees saved me. She's pretending not to notice them. They kept coming over to her, but the bees were swarming around the Nazis. And finally, they had to, the Nazis had to leave because they were getting, getting beat, bitten up. But notice here, she's with, these are probably tomato plants right here. And these are lupines. All the flowers are separate, distinct, and native to where she was. She had more close calls until July 1944 when Russian infa infantry marked in marched into the village and they were liberated. But before she was liberated, after she was liberated, she went to her house, which was now occupied by someone else, and then she went to the closest concentration camp, which was Madonic, to look for her family. And of course, there was no one. And so she joined the Polish army. But if you notice, look at the cabbages in the fields way in the back. The, those are growing on the ashes of dead Jews. And they are enormous. Well, I've been there. It's very fertile. By March 1945, her Polish unit, army unit, crossed the river into Germany, and the Russians had hanged Nazi officers on every tree along the road. A scene that was depicted in one of her wall hangings. I'm not sure I can find it, but I have it. So, oh, no. Hold on. No, I don't have it. So this one is, no, here we are. Um, finally, they, she, went, she was taken to a DP camp. She and Manya were reunited, and they each married men, they, survivors, that they met in the DP camp. And then eventually they came to America. And this is the only slide that has a clear blue sky. She's um, being carried by her father. And her aunt came on deck to greet them. So she was born in a DP camp. The daughter was born in a DP camp and saw America that way. And she, Esther told her daughter Bernice that coming to America meant that she'd never be persecuted again for being Jewish. This is all put into a book called Memories of Survival by the daughters. Uh, in Esther's work, I see memory, art, and resistance. She waited years to narrate her story, using her talent to evoke her past. She defied the odds twice, once by surviving Hitler's grip and again by using fabric art, story cloths, which is a non-traditional woman's art, to narrate her memoirs. Her pictures are as strong as her determination to survive. They reflect a variety of simple and complicated techniques, each stitch as distinct excuse me, as distinct as each episode in her life during those terrible years. They are compositions that reveal not just specific losses, but also triumphs of will and humanity. 
I would use much of my time, or all of my, could have used all of my time, and I could keep you to 7 o'clock, if I listed the books that have emerged from projects on women in the Holocaust, especially by feminist scholars, male and female feminist scholars. Our work has changed the field of Holocaust studies, and equally important, has influenced the study of genocide. No longer do researchers ignore the issue of women's victimhood or even women perpetrators in the acts of genocide. Finally, and it is finally, it is clear that there are millions of stories, six million, which ended tra tragically and will always be missing. Indeed, in all of the testimonies written, painted, or sewn, the recurring themes are violence, absence, and loss. It is up to us, because now you are secondary witnesses, to remember and to honor the survivors and the victims by teaching their stories and by celebrating their lives. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, you have some questions? Yeah, I will answer questions for as long as you ask them. Mm -hmm. Yes. Why was the Canada Papers? In Sorry? The Canada Papers? Why was the name Canada? Oh, Canada. Okay. These survivors were from Poland. Almost all the Poles thought of Canada, this is 1940, as a wilderness full of rich resources. They didn't know what Canada was. And so here was a warehouse full of clothing, jewelry, and any other items. Well, everything that the, that the Jews brought with them was t taken away. They had nothing. They were left naked. And so everything that they possessed, and they were told to take their good possessions with them when they were deported. Leave the junk behind, but take the good jewelry, take the good stuff. And so these were huge warehouses full of, of their, their treasures, the resources that the prisoners thought of as Canada full of wonderful resources. One camp, uh, I forgot the, which one, but I think it's Medinic, has a huge, two huge barracks full of just shoes. <laughs> And the shoes are sorted, men's and women's. And one barrack is all for children's shoes. And it's all dusty now and faded, but it's all there. Now, most of these were supposed to be taken, sent back to Germany for the um, Germans to use. And whatever could be used for the military for uniforms like fur linings and so on, that was used for the military. So it was for the use by the German peoplehood. And it was, it was a treasure trove. Yeah. Yes. Um, much had been done about the, the rape in camps. The rape? Yeah. Is that because um, German women was raped themselves by, by Russian soldiers? There, the, much has been done about the rape by the Russians as they went through. They raped, we have examples of them raping children as old, as young as eight, and women as old as 80. And that, that tells you right away that rape is not a sexual crime, it's a violent crime. So, you know, carried out by sexual means. Nothing was done until very, very recently on the rape of Jewish women because it was believed that because it was against the law, a Nuremberg law, it wasn't done. A German man risked a lot, especially a soldier, if he was caught because it was to be, because he had mixed his fluids with a contaminated woman. Contaminated meaning she was Jewish. And it would compromise and the word was pollute. It would pollute the German bloodline for at least six to eight generations. So he would be out of service. And I mean, Hitler wanted babies, but he wanted Aryan babies. 
So, uh, you know, that would be a terrible crime. It was a crime against the state to rape or to have any physical contact with a Jew. But rape was horrible. Yeah. That's what, that's what mine was on when you said if she would sell her body for food. That was camp, that was prisoner to prisoner. Okay. okay. There was a contingent of male prisoners in every camp that did things like roofing. That a, a, a man would have a chance of surviving to some extent if he said when they when the Nazis rounded them up, who's the electrician? Who's the roofer? Who's the tailor? Who's the now we we had a friend who was a violinist and he knew that the Nazis did not need violinists. So when he was in camp he raised his hand to be an electrician. He knew nothing about electricity, but he watched others. And it saved him to be an electrician. I mean, they don't need a violinist to build the roads, to sw drain the swamps. So these men had much more access to things around the camp. Uh, they even had access if they were weeds, because weeds are protein. And they could pull up weeds. Most of, most of the camps were mud. They were nothing but mud. And if you could get a weed, you had something to eat or something to trade. Um, if you got near the kitchen, you know, there was always stuff dumped out of the Nazi kitchens. So a uh, half-eaten apple, a half rotten potato. This was what they used to trade for sex. But they were prisoner to prisoner. And it angers me to this day very much. But that's beside the point. Yeah, and, well, just a, a, a comment that I would have about that is that the very um, extraordinary, unusual circumstances. So it's, it's really hard to judge in a case like that, I think. Someone else had said to me um, in a gathering like this, someone else said, um, it allowed the men to feel human again, that they had something to give and get. And so it, it helped the men with their identity. Yeah, and there were two, two more things. I, I think, if I'm not wrong, oh, that they did use musicians too. Then. Now, there were musicians in Auschwitz, there were musicians in some other camps. These were, uh, you've seen Playing for Time by Fania Fenelon. If you haven't, you should. Um, and there's also a book. I always recommend the book, but it's a good movie, uh, too. Um, it talks about the women's camp where they had an orchestra for the amusement of the Nazis and for playing as you went in and out of the camp. I mean, that was true sadism to have orchestras playing as you went to work to drain the swamps and, and work as a horse, really. Uh, but how many musicians do you need? You know, need more electricians. You, you know, you can always find a Jewish musician. You can't always find a Jewish electrician. So that was more important to have a trade than to have a skill, an, an art. Yes. Um, you mentioned earlier that it's still hard to get male scholars nowadays to admit that the rapes even happen. Why is that? Most male scholars are my age or older. My age, okay. Um, and they too were raised at a time when rape was not discussed. It's a different generation that you're in. You're not a, you're not, a woman who is raped is victimized. She's not damaged goods. But in those days, she was called damaged goods, even though it wasn't her fault. You, know, you have to put yourself back. Now, I was giving a paper on rape in Sarajevo a few years ago, and a guy came in. Um, th now, these are people, my peers. These are all colleagues. These are, you know, not students. These are all Holocaust scholars. And a guy came in, a colleague I know, and he heard me talking about rape, and he stopped. And he said, wait, there was no rape. It was against the law. <laughs> well, since when does rape a law against rape <laughs> ever, ever make a difference? You know, So um, people just didn't think about it because the law for the protection of German blood and honor was a Nuremberg law. That was, you know, those are very special laws. And, and, uh, and it was punishable by death. 
so uh, it was risky. But way out in the provinces, in Lvov, in Ukraine, and so on, in Minsk, and so on, it didn't get back to Berlin, and um, it was part of the killing process. Torturing Jewish women was part of the killing process. If any of you is interested, there's a book called The Holocaust by Bullets by a, a father, Patrick Debois, D-E-S-B-O-I-S. This priest was told by his grandfather for many years that he, his grandfather was a, um, a slave laborer in a small village in western Ukraine. But he, the, father, the grandfather always said, but the others had it worse. Well, once when the priest was in Lvov on a, doing something there with, with the cardinal, um, he asked the cardinal for permission to go look at that village because it, well, he wanted to see what his grandfather was talking about. And the mayor of the village said, yeah, here's the, here's the, 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 the labor camp. And uh, Father Patrick said, well, who were the others who had it worse? He said, oh, those were the Jews. He said, where's their cemetery? And he said, oh, oh, we don't have one. But I can bring together some people who witnessed it, who were involved as witnesses. And it, um, at the end of the day, at 5 o'clock, he brought people together. Father Patrick had a, didn't have a camera, didn't have a, an, or a tape recorder, but he listened as these villagers told him what they witnessed about rape, torture, cutting off women's breasts, slashing apart women's pregnant bellies, uh, bayoneting babies, uh, on and on and on. And he asked them what they were doing during this, and he said, we had jobs. We had to set up the table so they could eat between killings. The women had to do the cooking so that the SS uh, and the other officers would not be hungry while they were doing this. Uh, and we had to take their clothes because they were all made to strip naked before they were murdered. We had to put their clothes in bundles and so on and so forth. And he said, why don't we know about this? And they said, nobody ever asked us. So Father Patrick, he's a saintly soul, he organized for years, he's done it for about eight to ten years now, he's gone through western Ukraine to eastern Ukraine, and now he's doing it in Russia, to find where those cemeteries are. He can't label them as cemeteries because they would be grave robbers. It kind of is ridiculous because they were naked and so on, but people would think that they had their rings on. No, they had to give up their rings, they had to give up their gold teeth and so on. So, he, he, but he has identified and he has mapped all these, all these cemeteries. Um, and in some cases, he has aerial photographs of the open graves that they have opened up. Um, he has taken with him a, a metallurgist who brought a, um, you know, what do you call that? A, a metal detector. Because they can determine where the mass graves are by the bullets, the shells. And from the shells, they can determine back to the records in Berlin which unit it was that did the murdering. It's kind of an amazing thing. Um, so I don't remember the question, but I thought I would just tell you. <laughs> here and then here. I, I have a question about sort of the, the burden that you carry in your research and that the generation of survivors is you know, passing because of time, and yet you accrue these stories of uh, rape that are accompanied by either shame or a promise to keep as a secret. Guilt, even. And guilt, and, and, and yet you want to honor and tell the truth, and as this generation passes, like you have this knowledge, or you may be even in the pursuit of it, by speaking to women, and they may disclose to you, but say, but I can't, I can't be told. But you can have doubters say, well, until you give us the names, it's not true. And you have to carry that burden. How do you deal with that? Well, uh, there are two ways. One is I thought, I will, um, I will write their stories because they are dead. I will write their stories using a different name 
and trying to place them in a different context, but that always brings up the denier. Okay, so I I think that I would put someplace in a footnote, these are fictitious names, if, if you are interested, you'll have to contact me directly. And I would be very, very, very um, careful about telling about it. The other thing is, the Shoah Foundation interviewed 52,000 survivors. And they've been indexed. Now, each of the interviews is not so terrific. They're not all good interviews. Some of them um, don't have any follow-up questions. Sometimes the interviewers were not as knowledgeable as they should be and so on. But they're in a collection of 52,000. <laughs> There's a lot of information. And they, we have a collection of about 8,000 mentions of rape. And those women did tell the Shoah Foundation interviewers. So we have corroboration. But we also have trial records. I mean, the places where the Rasenchanda trials occurred, we have those records. And there's no denying that. Yeah. So it did occur. And it, it's, it's going to take the next generation of scholars to thoroughly go through it. But it, you have to remember also that it was such violence, it was rape and torture, and then murder. And it was wholesale, whole villages. This gentleman first, this young man. Uh, it's a very hard subject for you to talk on. You've got to be a very beautiful, warm-hearted <laughs> person to even talk about. What response do you get in the media and elsewhere when you talk? It doesn't get through. I don't know if it gets through. When I was teaching, I know it got through because um, I used to tell my students, here's my phone number. I know what's going to happen to you as you read these memoirs and we talk about it. You could call me before 11 o'clock at night and we can talk, but after 11, leave me alone. But, um, you know, I mean, there was a limit, but I knew it got to them. I had students who had been recovering alcoholics who went off the wagon, and their parents, I would always admit, they would disappeared, and I always called my students when they were absent. So, uh, very, very Jewish mother type, you know. <laughs> um, and I, I felt strongly that I, I got through because of their questions, the biggest, problem was that the more I talk, the more I cry. And the more you read the papers, every, every half decade is another genocide. And I just, you know, the slogan is never again, but it is ever again. It keeps on happening. And I don't know what it will take to stop genocide. That's my biggest problem. Thank you for the, your beautiful words. I arrived late, and I'm not sure if you started with it, but you made a comment about the difference between war rape and genocidal rape. Uh, just a passing comment. I have a whole book <laughs> chapter on it. Uh, I don't know if you, if you meant, you know, if you got into the specifics of it, I didn't hear it earlier, but if not, what were you referring to is? Before, um, before I studied the Holocaust, I thought of rape as a war issue, and I used the phrase ritual of war. It was like a, a bounty for soldiers. It was part of the process of winning, and if you were the rape, the losing. It was a, a way to demean your enemy, and a way to make sure the enemy knew that he lost. He lost his manhood, he lost his ability to protect his women, he lost his control. So it was proof of a victor's dominance. Uh, ritual kind of thing. Now, in the Holocaust, it, there was no need to do this because the Nazis were in control. There was no doubt that they were in control. This was wanton acts. And, and I haven't been able to pin down the theory. I haven't been able to work on that. Since the Holocaust, we know that rape has been a weapon of war. It was ethnic cleansing in, in Bosnia. It was ethnic cleansing again in Rwanda. So there was, I hate to say this, and I hate to be quoted on, it had a function. The function was 
a way to help win the war, to change the enemy, to change the status quo. In the Holocaust, that wasn't true. And before that, it wasn't true. But in Bosnia, Herzegovina changed everything. And it made us look at rape and sought to wonder what, what happened in the, in the war, you know, in the Holocaust. Uh, uh, yes, uh, Dr. Timberg. I was going to say that uh, before I came over here, I was checking out the, uh, the, the eyewitness site on the web that cat catalogs uh, many of the testimonies that the Shoah Foundation has provided. Yes. And, and I was looking for something along uh, 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 rape or uh, offenses against women. I mean, that battle still being won, in other words, for those who've cataloged the, uh, the testimony, we, we still haven't been able to get into those documents or into those indexes. They, they don't get into the indexes, I think, because of the reticence of the indexer. Um, but the Shoah Foundation in November gathered 14 of us from the world, you know, from Africa, from most of the world. And we met to discuss the issue of rape and what we're going to do about, because they have found, they have found some testimonies of rape, of thousands. And you have to go to the Shoah Foundation in LA at USC and sit there and sit there and sit there. Not everything that the Shoah Foundation has in its um, archives is accessible to, uh, to colleges and universities. You can get it all from Yad Vashem if you go to Jerusalem. You can get it all from USC in LA. And you can get it all from the Holocaust Museum. Those are the three places you can get everything, all the access. Otherwise, it's rather limited, unless you know somebody. And if you, I once needed to find something out, and I happened to call the Shoah Foundation, and it happened to be um, the guy who answered was a childhood friend of one of my children, and he remembered me, and he said, "Whatever you want, I remember your cookies," you know that kind of thing, and and he sent me what I needed, and I sent it back, you know. So, yeah. Yes, Neil. I'm calling on my husband because he has his hand up. Then I will get to. Do you want to comment about the Russian archives? Yes, I should. There's so much to talk about. In 1989, with the end of the Soviet Union, um, the Russians' archives, you, the Holocaust Museum in, in Washington, got in touch with, contacted the archivists, the appropriate archivists in, uh, in Moscow to look at the materials, the files, that um, the Russians confiscated on their way from east to west because the Russians got into Berlin first and they all along Poland, the Russians got in there, and, and the Russians, <clears throat> the Germans could not uh, um, could could not burn all of their records at once. So the Russians picked up millions of files, millions, and they were stuck in Moscow, unindexed, untranslated on anything. And the U.S. Holocaust Memorial Museum and Yad Vashem, mainly the museum here in Washington. Um, struck a deal. They would combine materials, they would give them access, the Holocaust Museum in Washington would give access to the Russian uh, scholars if the Russian scholars would give us access. And Yad Vashem got access to both. And so this will, these are millions, millions of archives, uh, millions of f files, because as I said, the, the Russians got there first. Uh, we got Western Germany, and that mean, meant there was more time for the Germans to burn their, their records. But the Russians came in like gangbusters, you know, except around Warsaw. Uh, oh, thank you. I, I knew uh, it helps. I think uh, we have one more question. Yes, speak at seven. <laughs> Our classroom will be meeting after this. So. In, you, in our classroom, right? In our classroom, right? You, <laughs> yes. Um, you mentioned a while ago that um, Hitler was after the um, Aryan pure German blood. And um, yet today we find there are groups in, in, in places like Germany that still practice this, <laughs> this thing. And um, what you say is there is a, a lack of teaching about the Holocaust or 
a lack of um, educators that knows a lot about the Holocaust is the reason why you still find people in certain parts of the world still practicing this sort of thing. May I say that it's not, it, it's not for uh, lack of knowledge or lack of access to information that makes deniers deny the Holocaust. And the neo-Nazis are neo-Nazis because they want to be. Um, and they are just against anyone they decide is inferior. And that's, there is no, you, there is no way that you can make a denier into a believer if he or she does not want to be. I, I have to say that. There are bigoted, idiotic, nasty people. And it's, it's hard for me to say that. But I have to face it. I have to face it. The only way we can make it, we can mitigate it against, mitigate it is by saying to anybody who makes a slur, no, I don't want to hear that, it's not true. If you speak up at the beginning, you sort of disarm those bigots. I mean, it puts yourself in jeopardy, it's not comfortable, but it's necessary. The only thing for evil to happen is for good people to do nothing or something like that. Yeah. yeah. And good people have to be good about saying, no, that's not true, and I don't want to hear anymore. It's something we have to teach our children. We have to be gutsy. We have to. One more question, because this young woman had a question. Well, I was just going to comment that um, the Aryan groups are largely based on ignorance. You know, the people are ignorant, and they're not um, taking this knowledge that they could be taking. And, uh, I wish that were so, but they're ignorant and bigoted, <laughs> and don't want to be informed. Um, sorry, but that's really what I have to say. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.